Welcome to Strip Cover Look, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for um, part two of a five-part series as we mosey through... Camino Reel? Sure. Did we get that right this time? I think. Tennessee Williams. So yeah. A little Chapters, better. or blocks, six through ten. Um... And before we really get into breaking things down, we have a bit of wrap-up to get into. So, what happened? Block 6. Kilroy turns down a vacancy at the Ritz Men Only to sleep under the stars, where Gutman harasses him under the threat of a vagrancy charge to don the attire of a patsy. But Kilroy is no one's fool. He tosses the get-up into Gutman's face to distract him. He is chased. He is caught. He is patsy. Block 7. Jacques gets a letter. The money he's been waiting on. Er, right? Marguerite and Jacques go to dinner. There is drama of the mellow variety. Block 8. Lord Byron. Lord Byron happens. He shows up, melodramas a bit, then goes ahead and decides to leave. Block 9. The fugitivo lands and is accepting outgoing passengers. Marguerite tries to leave, does not have the money, sends Jacques to get the money. It is not the right money. He goes and gets the right money, but she does not have her papers. The Fugitivo leaves. Block 10. Marguerite admits to Jacques that she would have left without him. He knows. He knows and he doesn't care because he loves her. Which, like she tells him, is like, totes dumb. All right. So where do you want to start with this? Well, what what have you got? What have you? Because you seem down on the text. Uh, last week was brutal. I had no idea what was going on. Nothing made sense. I think this week's a little better. Uh, it's still very bizarre. It's still very uh, surreal, dreamlike. I'm gonna stick with that. Uh, I'm still gonna bank on the fact I don't think these people are alive. I think this is gonna be some weird twist at the end where everybody's dead it's the sixth sense all over again something like that i don't know that i i don't know that that's the proper terminology here um i mean obviously you've got lord byron who's passed yep but um you <laughs> also have what i believe is a fictional character in marguerite i would assume um well but i mean she's from fiction i don't know if she's based on a real person okay um she's from oh Ladane La au Camellias. So it was, a, I think, a French novel. Okay. I think that these are not living or dead people, but the essence of individuals. And okay. I think that is from where the main thrust of this piece springs. Because I think that the main thrust of this piece is not whether someone exists or not because you do, this is the assumption that you do exist, but how are you using it? Okay. I think that's what this is getting at. Well, it's good to know you cleared up that I exist. I appreciate that. Well, that's one of those, I mean, it's one of those questions, to be or not to be, do I exist? Are we all in a, yeah. are we in a, a simulation? But I don't think that's what we're getting at here. And I don't think we're getting at are we alive or dead. I think the question of existence with this piece seems very much to be whether or not the essence of a person is actualized. Whether or not the, um, the underlying desires of a person come true. Your okay. hopes, your dreams, your aspirations. Okay. I think you hit the nail on the head last week, though, when you brought up the symbolism of the birds, because we, again, get just constantly beat over the head with the birds. It's the only thing that comes back. It's coming back again. Uh, so, again, and I think believe there's even a representation about, like, how uh, caged birds just learn to get along with each other, but they always learn, like, yearn to fly. Caged birds accept each other, but flight is what they long for. So, I think that might shed a little bit more light on this piece here. These people seem trapped. Uh, I don't know why they're trapped, though. Well, they seem contradictory, I think, to what you're suggesting. They seem trapped in life. Yes. Not trapped outside of life. Um, this seems to be... So there is 
the quote from Gutman to Byron. This is a port of entry and departure. There are no permanent guests. The way that feels to me was like St. Joe. Okay. St. Joe found, felt, so St. Joe is a college town, a small college town. Um, in the summers, the place is dead. Fair. In the winters, the place is dead. It is during semesters of the college year that there are people there are people racing down the main dragon town that there are people making noise outside of apartments that that the place comes to life it is a place of holding okay it is a place of detention perhaps it is such it is like a a, a quarter life crisis a midlife crisis it's a place you get stuck okay and that seems to be what's going on here because there are these fringe people. Um, the Byron. Byron exists because Byron is an essence. But is he a complete essence? Is he a complete thought? Um, Marguerite is another troubled character. Um, then you've got the playboy, Jacques. Right, Jacques is um, a playboy who is falling in love with a prostitute. Um, then you have Kilroy, who seems to be very much in a place of transition. Okay, he seems to be in the place of transition between you. Didn't, you played a sport, right, or you lifted or something? Yeah, I've did done a few sports here and there. Okay. Um, how old were you when you quit those things? 16-ish. Were you old enough to have had dreams in those things? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you always think about something like that. And when you were forced to realize you're just not that good, it's a place of transition, isn't it? Okay. That is just not sustainable. It's a place of transition. That you're just not going to be able to play that sport in college. It's a place of transition. So these all seem to be people in transition. Byron even states so much as... Uh, I've got to go find the next war, right? Okay. Which suggests that he was there between things. He was there not existing. Um, so there's, with Marguerite, apparently the text from which she comes, and I've never read it, uh, she was a prostitute, and she wore a red camellia when she was menstruating, which we get a hint of at the beginning. Okay. And she wore a white camellia when she, the rest of the time, when she could work. But she states when she enters this piece, it's always white now. Uh, white classically means clean and pure. Here, we have, we, we almost, we beat white up. Even. Okay. The color of white is beaten to mean um, perhaps the loss of function. As opposed to purity, it is the loss of function. Um, because it's always white now suggests that she no longer menstruates, suggests that she no longer is able to have children. Um, children oftentimes represent dreams or the future. We want a better life for our children. We want our children to survive us. So with that out of the picture, um, there only remains the possibility of work. Okay. And this is when we get this is when we get the quote, caged birds accept each other, but flight is what they long for. Obviously, this carries on. Um, and on 72, Marguerite says to Jacques, Oh, Jacques, we're used to each other. We're a pair of captive hawks caught in the same cage, and so we've grown used to each other. That's what passes for love at this dim, shadowy end of the Camino Real. That is what passes as love, being used to one another. And even that word, used, mm -hmm. we're used to one another, which means we've used each other up. We've used up the primary force behind one another so that we are not, we are not, even at that point, to someone who has had the job experience that Marguerite has had, 
making love with your lover Jacques is no longer making love, it's going to work. So all there is at that point is going to work. You've lost even the idea of love. And that seems to be, for me, to me, um, the main thrust here. Again, coming back to this idea of dreams that we once had. Okay. Is the Camino real? The place where the dreams have died? Okay. Is it the place where the dreams come in a little bit beat up, a little bit torn around the edges, but still whole-ish? And by the time our character leaves the Camino, those dreams are distinguished or extinguished. I'm inclined to start agreeing with you slightly. Um, the whole idea is, you know, this where dreams basically come to die. We get the constant reminder of purity. There's always the idea of regaining one's purity. Uh, Byron's talking about it with uh, the burning of Shelley, how it was such a pure experience. You mentioned it with Marguerite. And at the very end here, it seems that we're leading up to the restoration of virginity. Well, we've had that a couple times now from the same character, which makes me wonder, did it not work the first time, or does she just need it restored <laughs> well, again? Well, you know, it's been right? a couple weeks, so you right. got to, you know, refresh, you got to, we're good to go. Uh, but he comes back to this idea of purity, and it seems that these characters are basically trapped in this life, and they've lost their innocence, they've lost their purity, and that's what they seem to be trying to get back to. And if we want to go with the idea of dreams, dreams are a very pure, innocent thing. So maybe that is what we're kind of looking at here a little bit. Uh, something else, though, I, I'd really like to bring up here. Are if, you moving on from this point? If you've got more, please um, continue. Well, I think that it, so I think that what it does, though, is it begs the question as to what do these characters currently want? So sticking with Marguerite, obviously it is not Jacques that she wants. She is used to Jacques. Okay. Um, but what is it for which she longs? Is she the prostitute who longs for solitude, but settles for the playboy who longs for a monogamous relationship? She seems very much at the end of this part of the reading to be going off to sleep with someone else. Is this sleeping with someone else because she wants to do it, or is it just to communicate to Jacques, don't get attached, baby. There's nothing there. Okay. I would have left you. I would have left you had I had the chance. Okay. I, again, though, I, I think that kind of falls back into the idea of uh, this innocence and purity. It's something that the characters long for, but they don't have. And if they remain, because at this point, uh, at that text, she cannot escape the Camino Real. She did not get on the ship, whatever it is, that came in. The Fugitivo. Fugitivo, which I still don't know if it was a boat or a plane or something. It seemed to be a plane. However, once she's made, you know, kind of peace with the fact that she's not getting out of here, it's back to the old ways. There's no way to escape that. There's no way to get back to that purity and innocence. So, well, back to work. She doesn't seem to be one who's longing for purity and innocence. I think that's what they're all longing for. They're all longing to get away from this life that they're currently living. Which kind of segues way into, or segues way into the next point I've got to make here. Everyone here seems to play a role. Everybody has a purpose. And the characters who are infinitely trapped in the Camino Real seem to be stripped of their name. They're given an assigned role by the society they're within. That's where you get the idea of the patsy. Mm -hmm. You're the patsy now. This is the survivor. This is the dreamer. These characters have been completely stripped from their identity. They're never going to escape this area now because they are now part of that society. And society says, this is what you are. So maybe that's this artsy Tennessee Williams push right here to say, you know, do not you know, go with what society tells you. Do not get beaten down by society. There is more to it. And with the whole uh, scene with the Patsy, that seems to be the first time a character has adamantly fought against the role that's being pushed upon them. So I think we're going to come back to that. And I think that kind of ties in with this idea of, you know, purity and dreams and, you know, longing for a better life. It's that push to not be what society is forcing you to be. Well, and I think that, so on 58, we've got this, we've got a few pages of Byron being Byron. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is just melodramatic as all hell, right? Uh, and we get this quote. That's very true, senor. 
But a poet's vocation, which used to be my vocation, is to influence the heart in a gentler fashion than you have made your mark on that loaf of bread. He ought to purify it and lift it above its ordinary level. For what is the heart but a sort of, a sort of instrument that translates noise into music, chaos into order, a mysterious order? So on a meta level with what you were just talking about, here we are begging and pleading for a def definition of poetry. And what is it that poetry is supposed to do? Byron is contending that poetry is to restore that uh, purity. Okay. Now, since Byron seems to have unlocked this key to restore the purity, the goal that all these characters are pushing for, Byron is therefore allowed to leave. He can escape the Camino Real. Or at least the fact that his dreams are real enough to him that this society cannot talk him out of them. Okay. Which seems to be, again, this society seems to me to be this quarter-life crisis, this midlife crisis, this place where you're supposed to lose that. Okay. And Byron, having had a prolonged stay there, still couldn't be talked out of it. As melodramatic and weird as he is, he can't be talked out of it. Okay. And so he's allowed to leave. And there's but a... even, in, even then, they state how difficult and dangerous it's going to be for him to leave. Yes. They yes. try to talk him out of it. They do. They do. But, you know, that's always the case. When you have somebody who's you're really setting out to pursue their passions, there's always going to be somebody who tells you, hey, that ain't going to work out. You're going to get a degree in literature? That's a bad idea. Well, and it's, it's... I'm not sure what to do with it yet. But one exit seems to be a cliff, right? Okay. Through the, remember the little uh, the arch through which Kilroy had stuck his head? That seems to be a cliff, a very giant drop-off. Am I wrong that Byron, when he left, seemed to be going through a desert? I think he went through the arch, though, didn't he? Did he? Okay. I think he went I, through. I couldn't remember, um, but it seemed to me that he was not risking falling off of a cliff, but rather um, 40 years through the desert. Fair enough. Uh, there's a lot of hypotheticals that we keep throwing this, you know, maybe this is this, maybe this is that. I think it's a point, you know, if people are reading along with us to address. This is a pretty difficult text. This is all over the place, man. And it's not a standard novel. Again, this is a play. But even with a little bit of theater background, this is a difficult one to wrap your thumb around. There's a lot of stuff happening here. There's a lot of stuff that's not making sense. And the scenes just go from one to one to one to one. There's not really a smooth transition between them. Uh, that makes this very linear. I think that this is to be communicated sort of in the same way that is Impressionist poetry. Okay. That one stanza may have absolutely nothing on the surface to do with the one that precedes it or the one that follows it. But it is the message therein that we have to catch. And I think, that's, I think that we have been discussing that message throughout this rather than the story, which I think might be Tennessee Williams' point. Okay. That it is the message, not the story here. Because in that way, I mean, you know, you've been unemployed for a while now. Um, jobless, carless, without love. It's not a bad life. You get used to it. Yeah, but it's sort of a quarter-life crisis, right? Fair enough. That's the same for everyone. The scenes are different. My quarter-life crisis was being stuck in the monotony of the workplace and the workplace and the workplace, having three jobs and, and using none of them to get anywhere. Um, that was sort of my quarter-life crisis, the breaking point for me. The breaking point for you was showing up to work one day that was it. And that was it. Um, but everyone's quarter-life crisis, midlife crisis, these crises, crises through which we go, that are not brought on to us by a disease or, or a sickness, an illness, um, something like that, a tragedy. They're all the same. Okay. In that we enter them one way. Perhaps there's only one way to leave. But for all of us, that one way to leave is different. Okay. But essentially, it's through the same door of self-reflection. 
is through the same door of saying, okay, well, when I was 21 and I was struggling with one job, my life sucked in this way. Now I'm 23 and I'm going to three jobs and my life sucks in another way. There must be something within me that has to change for this suck to stop. Okay. It's through that, that, that door of self-reflection we have to walk. And maybe that's what we're looking at here. Maybe these characters are, you know, a Byron seems to be the one who's capable of walking through that door. I'm suggesting that it is what we're looking yeah. for. Uh, and therein lies another irony, because it is Byron who is hobbled. Okay. Right? It is Byron who has a, a physical ailment that um, he, he's not able to walk correctly. He's not able to walk with ease. Okay. Um, hmm. Only, I, I, again, I, I, a lot of this takes just soaking in. <laughs> Every time I come down, we start talking about one thing, and it really makes you think about the piece, because I don't know if there is an answer for this piece. Uh, if it doesn't end in some weird dreamlike state, which I'm banking on, I don't think we are going to get a conclusion. I, I'm curious to know why you're banking on that. I don't, it, that's just the feel I get. Even is when you look at the stage directions. because this thing is so ephemeral in itself? Yes, and, and like that seems to be the few stage directions you're given with this, that's what it keeps coming back to. It's very dreamlike. It's very strange. Scenes are just popping up here and there. Nothing really makes sense. But we do, I, I, so nothing makes sense on a narrative level. But I think that sub-narratively, everything makes a whole lot of sense. Like, what is it that does not make sense on a character level here? The characters make sense. You, each character has their own individual struggle, basically, that they're going through. It's easy to understand and identify with the characters. And their dialogue is a little forced, but that's the nature yeah. of play, right? Yeah. That's the nature of theater. But how everything just comes together, it's just not meshing. It seems very scattered. Now, again, this could be Tennessee Williams basically just playing on chaos. Maybe this is his representation of chaos on the stage. Because I would assume life on the Camino Real, whatever you want to say it is, is a little chaotic. It's a little hectic. And maybe that's what we're forcing. Maybe that's what we're giving the audience. But with these scattershot scenes here and there, these dreamlike uh, states, the constant reminder that you know we are in this weird kind of dreamy world, it's a little off-putting. It's hard to kind of put your thumb on exactly what's going on. So it's just, it's stuck in the back of my mind that there's something more here going on. I don't think this is going to be cut and dry. I, th I think you're perhaps being misled by your own expectations. It's possible. I think that the only thing that does not make sense here is a main narrative. Okay. Um, is, is, is the setting consistent? Yeah. Are the characters consistent? For the most part. Is the dialogue basically consistent? The dialogue is made up of this dichotomy of the mundane, which is mundane enough for Gutman to shoot a guy who's begging for a place, mm -hmm. all the way through, or there's the dichotomy between that and the lofty, um, poetic sort of philosophic ramblings of someone like Byron or even Marguerite and Jacques as they sit together having a meal. But there's no real in-between, right? Um, right? But that's consistent. It is consistent. That's fair. So I think that the only thing that's not consistent is we don't know where we're going. But we do know we're going forward. We do know we're going forward. And again... And what do you know about your life? You're going forward. Tomorrow's about who you gonna, got. Yeah, tomorrow's going to happen. That sun's going to rise and you're going to be expected to pay the light bill. And again, maybe that's Tennessee Williams kind of playing on the idea of chaos. You know, this is supposed to be a chaotic thing and the only thing that's consistent is the constant grind forward. But what's chaotic here? I, I, this feels very chaotic. You have characters here who are embodying other characters uh, with the idea of, you know, becoming the patsy. Nothing makes sense. Gutman just comes out and shoots somebody, and it's fine and dandy. Nothing makes sense how. 
we literally have a character coming in out and announcing that we are going to have the restoration of virginity of my sister. You're looking at a place that's not the place we live, though, where something like that may have been a reality. Uh, we, again, have a plane that shows up out of nowhere with no warning, no expectation. Nobody knows when it comes, when it goes, but only select people are allowed on, and it's very rare. There are some weird, weird things going weird, on here. Weird, I will grant you. Weird, I will absolutely grant and you. And they seem to put us out of the realm of reality. And I think maybe that's what's given me this dream, like uh, maybe something's a little weird going on here. It's, and I don't want to bring this up now because I think I'm going to use it for my uh, recommendation during the review, but it's sort of like Birdman. Have you ever seen the movie Birdman? I've seen it once. You've got this strange dreamlike quality to that film. Fair. The only thing, so the difference between this and that is there was a narrative to Birdman. Okay. I don't know that there's a narrative here. That, well, I don't know that there is... <sighs> the narrative is, I believe, very much that life depends on whether or not you're going to give up your aspirations. And if you're going to, boy, the Camino is just going to break you and you never really leave. Okay. At, at this point, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think that is the overarch theme here. Uh, it's this idea, you know, this is uh, where dreams come to die. If you accept what society's throwing at you, you're going to get stuck here in this miserable hell, and only through your push are you going to be able to get out of this. I just don't know if it's going to play off that clean. We'll see, though. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. Well, I, so, I mean, I'm not going to argue that. I think that we're too early in the text, really, to understand that part yet. I'm just, I, I, want, to, uh, I want to explore the idea of chaos and where you... Th where you feel the chaos in the text. So if it's not a dreamlike state, if it's not, we're getting rid of that, we do have scenes that have no transition whatsoever. It just drops right into a new scene. It's very fast paced. Things don't make sense and are never actually addressed. It's just the way it is. It's very chaotic. If you imagine this from a, an audience perspective, trying to watch this and trying to follow along, you're going to feel rushed, you're gonna feel overwhelmed. The characters actually are yelling at the audience as well, which is a little jarring in theater because we're breaking that fourth wall. It's a very chaotic piece. And again, whether that's part of this dreamlike idea or whether this is part of Tennessee Williams saying, yeah, the world sucks and it is chaos, I don't know. But I, I 100%, this is a chaotic show. So let, let's dichotomize, if I can go back to that word, narrative from theme. Okay. Is this thematically chaotic, do you feel? No. I if think... we stick with that theme of, you know, this is, you know, how you're getting out, this is your way out, you can't let the world beat you down, I, I think it's, we can pull a pretty decent theme from it. Narrative-wise, though, it's a little scattered. I, yeah, I, so, that's interesting. Okay. The idea of getting out. Is getting out success or is getting out just keeping your dreams? We'll have to see. The only character that we've seen get out is Byron. No, but I don't mean in the story. I mean as a, as a life thematic question. Is getting out, is getting out, is getting out of life alive your dream surviving, or is it success? I don't know. You just got philosophical on me. Well, that's what we're here for, damn uh -huh. it, Salty. What do you, okay. Success or not, I mean, if you can just ride it out and, you know, make it that far. Well, but the th so here's the thing. Is life without those dreams worth pursuing? Sure. Is it? Why not? characters who live on the Camino Real, there are some of them who have a pretty healthy existence, have well, a good living. Well, healthy exi I don't care. Is that worth pursuing? Is that worth doing? Even if you know, if you knew you were never going to be successful at what it is you hope to do, if you knew that, is it worth maintaining the dream? That's the that's the question that we're forced to ask through all of these quarter-life crisis, mid-life crisis, et cetera. Okay. 
Have you? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be back next week. Hopefully we'll give an answer to this question. As we continue forward, Camino Real, Tennessee Williams. We will be reading blocks 11 through 16 next week here on Strip Cover Lit. If you like this kind of thing, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Give this video a like as well. And as always, there's a link to our Patreon to be found in the description below.